We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared, extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. All right, welcome to another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by GraniteGrok.com and the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We are here live almost every Saturday from 9 to 11 a.m. Eastern Time in the lovely CNHT studios in beautiful Concord, New Hampshire, and this week is no exception. Uh, We're going to start out with Steve Kenda, who's running for District 24 State Senate, and then later on in the program, we are going to have Kevin Kervik in a few quick housekeeping items. Uh, Go to GraniteGrok.com, please, and find the free jerry delimas post you have about a day or two to uh, complete an um a uh, petition petition thank you that's for, the word. for his release for his release his hearing is monday so a little a little habeas corpus required here and we've had some great response to that and i hope that you know at least he, he still has to face trial but they want to let him let him go home while he waits and he could wait for years because you know the way the judicial system works these days and just ask Mark Stein. He's in year five waiting to have his trial in D.C. heard. Uh, against the uh, Neanderthal hockey stick yes, man? the man-made hockey stick, yes. And then at CNHT Picnic, we have a location. We have a date, July 9th. It's a Saturday. It will be from 12 to 3 p.m. And I don't have the location open, but it is in Manchester this year. You can go to granitrock.com. It's right on the front page underneath the post where we're streaming this program right now. And uh, you can check it out. It's 15 bucks. You can order your tickets online, and you can also pay at the door, but space is limited. There will be candidates for governor, candidates for Congress. Uh, Rich Gerard is hosting. The um, featured speaker is uh, James O'Keefe. So, well, anyway, we're here to talk to Steve, who is once again in a primary to run for a state Senate seat, District 24, Seacoast. What towns are those? The uh, 11 Seacoast towns include uh, Newcastle, Rye, Northampton, Hampton, Hampton Falls, Seabrook, Southampton, Newton, K- uh, Kensington, Green- Greenland, and Stratham. That's a couple. Yep, yeah, and Mike, uh, just so we could start with Mike. Steve, uh, and please give my regards to Skip. I just want to thank you for having me on this morning. Sure, no problem. Uh, Skip's still participating, but Skip's got a lot of stuff to do family-wise, so he blogs when he can, and under extreme duress, we can get him down here. (laughs) Busy, busy, busy guy. So uh, you're running for state senate. Again, obviously, it's a four-person race. Yes, it should be uh, pretty exciting. I think there's some some good people out there. I've seen filings for uh, Dan Innes and Ray Tweedy and Jim Majuri. I may have to mispronounce his last name, Major mm-hmm. but he's a, a selectman in my town, uh, Northampton. So, oh, so. wishing them all uh, the very best for a, a, a happy and healthy <laughs> primary season. Okay, so. great. The um, uh, I don't live out on the seacoast. I mean, I th- and I don't hear a lot from them except for the Democrats and everybody else from out there, uh, because we get a lot of um, you know Portsmouth Herald stuff and Seacoast Online stuff, and you get a yeah. lot of interesting um, left wing perspective. But um, <laughs> Um, what what is it that is of interest to the people in the di- district twenty four? What are they thinking about? What are they? I mean, you obviously you've talked to them last time you ran. You'll be talking to them again this time. I don't think a whole heck of a lot has changed. Well, no, the supporters that were behind me were really looking for a somewhat more conservative voice than was, was being represented by the then senator who's retiring now, Nancy Stiles, who I think has done an excellent job with constituent services. However, they're Given the fact that I received almost 40% of the primary vote last time out, there's clearly a, a need for someone to express the voice of conservatives. I think what we'll hear from most of the primary candidates will be uh, similar issues around what's going on in the state from an economic perspective. The union leader did a stunning indictment on Maggie's uh, this low unemployment, perceived low unemployment here in New Hampshire. And in the past 12 years of the Democrats running the show, what we've seen is ever-increasing regulations, taxes, fees, on an ever-shrinking pie of, of employers. Um, and not everyone wants to spend their time commuting over the border <coughs> Excuse me to, to find work in Massachusetts. Even if um, the taxpayers pay for a train to send them? <laughs> well, <laughs> won't happen on my watch. <laughs> yeah. So when it comes, when it comes, what, what do you need to do? I mean, clearly uh, when our business taxes are higher than 
Massachusetts. I mean, it's a, it's a starting point. But and again, I think you'll hear this: we got to reduce regulations, we got to reduce business taxes, we got to make it a more business-friendly environment. And, and I think all the, you'll hear that from all the candidates. And to a large extent, they're they're correct. But I think what needs to be expressed out on the seacoast is well. What's really different about you know the candidates? Where do we where do we distinguish ourselves? And again, I can't speak for the the particular positions, but people need to know that where you know Nancy and I don't necessarily see eye to eye. We we may both consider ourselves fiscal conservatives, but on three key issues: um, Medicaid expansion, uh, Common Core, and I'm sorry, it's skipping me at the moment. Um, Derailed your commuter train of thought. No, it did. You <laughs> took me off. Took me off the mark there. Um, it'll come to me, but uh, it, it, it and Planned Parenthood. Excuse me. Oh, funding. Funding. Planned of, funding for, for right. Planned Parenthood. These are these are critical issues to conservatives in the, in the Seacoast District, and uh, by all accounts, they're they're just not being represented uh, adequately. And I don't again know where the other candidates stand on, on those particular issues, but. Uh, for the people who are uh, either home edu- people interested in school choice, people interested in homeschooling, people who are looking for charter schools, uh, another devastating you know, veto by uh, Maggie mm, just this week. Just, yeah. just this week. So uh, those are the, the kind of differences. Now, Nancy and I, we had um, there were a couple of other issues where I think there were significant differences. I would say the her support for the the buffer zone around abortion clinics. I mean, wherever you come down on the uh, the pro life issue. Uh, for me, it was a restriction of your First Amendment rights, um, and I, I vehemently against the buffer zone around abortion clinics. And she and I didn't see eye to eye on the casino. She was a big supporter of, of the casino. I, I'm, I like the way things are working right now. I think you're looking at charitable enterprises prizes where you've got local employers with local employees giving to local charities, and the state's getting your revenue out of that. I think that works. I don't think we need a big casino out-of-state money, and it's probably going to upset a couple of people in the... the that's in an the interesting issue area, because there are, that, that really is a bipartisan mm-hmm. issue in this state. Mm-hmm. Gambling, even when we had a Democrat legislature, they had a really hard time trying to get that through. Um, it's just not something people are interested in, really, and there's not enough Democrats and not enough Republicans who really want to see uh, millennial gaming come in and bring in all their money and all their lobbyists. And, and I, we've argued against it for a lot of reasons, not, not against gambling, like you said. If people want to gamble, that's fine. But it, should be, it shouldn't be state-run. It should be, you know, as you described it. Uh, but when you invite, and there's another state, and I just read the article this past week, and I can't remember what state it is, but somebody was talking about, maybe it was New Jersey, no, it wasn't New Jersey, maybe it was Pennsylvania, how the lobbyists, the gambling lobbyists, were taking control of the legislature. And that was our argument. They've got a lot of money. And we're talking about 400 House reps who get paid 100 bucks a year. And you're talking about, and, and the State Senate, 24 seats, lots of lobbyists hovering around the Senate because that's the mm-hmm. easiest chamber to influence. You bring in millions of dollars behind gambling lobbyists, and they are going to do everything in their power to control that legislature the way they want to. Exactly. And that's mm-hmm. the risk. Mm-hmm. You know, the Planned Parenthood thing, it's a public sidewalk, free speech first. I am I'm with Mark Stein. I'm a free speech absolutist. There is no hate speech. There is no – you have to protect free speech in a, a federal republic. You have to do it. So uh, – but the gambling thing, I'm waiting – I was – every year, you know, Jim Rubin stopped trying to stop it, and I thought, oh, my God, we're going to get gambling, <laughs> you know, <laughs> casino gambling. But it um, hasn't happened, and you get Democrats against it and Republicans against it. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, and I didn't mean Jim Rubens was for it. I think he was. He, he opposed it. He blocked it. He for every single year, Lou D'Alessandro came in with Millennial Gaming behind him, pushing for a casino, pushing for a casino, and he pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. Yeah, I was, I don't think it means Jim Rubens now approves of, uh, of of the shenanigans behind gambling. I think he just had other first. He doesn't. We had him on last week, and he explained it. Yeah. Uh, so so, you know, but the thing about the gambling to me uh, is. As you said, the money behind it, the influence, and the fact that it was cronyism. It wasn't, hey, you know what? If you can buy the land and you can build a casino, we'll talk about, um, you know, that that didn't work, Steve. Is it, uh, did it, did it yeah, die? Yeah, it died. I got to oh, do it. Okay. Anyway, you, know, it, you come in, you you buy the land, you uh, you bring up, set up the design, you get the permits, and why shouldn't you? 
build a casino. But you come in and you you try and get in bed with the state legislature and have it as a state-sanctioned uh, crony capitalist effort where one casino provider gets to come in and the others get to be shut out. That's just plain wrong. It's monopoly. You know, yeah. I don't gamble. I don't think it's a good thing to do. But, you know, it's it's about freedom and choice. You want to choose to do stupid things as long as you don't hurt anybody else. Well, that's supposed to be what you're allowed to do. And so... Well, that's why I think this, the charitable operation is a, good, is a fair compromise. The charitable operation is a good, a good compromise. You know, the, the way the land that was the racetrack in Salem is now being sold off in pieces for, for profitable uses from which the state will get money, uh, tax money. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But for the state government to try and steer a preferred casino operator into that site – that's why there was so much pushback. You know, never mind the morality issues of whether you should or shouldn't gamble. The, cr- the cronyism is the real issue, to my mind. So, um, and so a huge issue: Medicaid expansion. Can they continue to expand it? Um, uh, a lot of cases have been made that that you know the federal government will inevitably stop supplying enough money to support it, and there will be a huge argument not to defund it, and that we will end up with a state income tax. Uh, do you agree with that possible scenario, and what do you think our path moving forward is to address that? Sure, and I, I think the uh, the Democrat, uh, the state rep from Ride, Tom Sherman, who's going to be running for Nancy's seat as the uh, in the state senate race, is a, is a is a doctor and a proponent of. <clears throat> the Medicaid expansion. Um, my view always comes back to uh, uh, Tenth Amendment issues. Uh, I don't like whether it's Common Core or Medicaid expansion. This sending money down to Washington, letting them take their skim off the top, sending it back to us with a whole bunch of strings that are attached to it. Um, I understand that there are people out there that the mindset is, well, it's federal money and we should take our piece of it. But you know what? It goes right back to the reason I'm running. It's, it's, about, it's about my kid. I want him to get a good education, a quality education. I want to be able to find work up here in New Hampshire. And I don't want to burden him with the $20 trillion in debt. If everybody in either Washington or at state capitals is all about grabbing as much of our kids and grandkids' money, it's, it's, it's the, the anger that you know, the, either the Trump people or the Sanders people that have tapped into. I mean, the reason they've been successful, the, 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 pe- the group of people that are not protected classes in this country, the hardworking, taxpaying men and women of this country are tired of seeing their kids' and grandkids' futures erode. It's, they're talking about it being the, the first time, in the generation coming in, not having the same quality of life that, that we've had. And that I put it squarely on as baby boomers. We're the ones who've been in power. We're the ones who've been in charge. And we're the ones who've been tr- you know, borrowing from the Treasury to fund programs that it's wonderful to be compassionate, but only if you can afford it. And we've been borrowing for far too long. So my objection is, is, is much philosophical and, and Tenth Amendment related. As I say, uh, there should be a lot more in the way of states' rights. I, I, what I need is a governor and an attorney general with a... Uh, 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 let's call it intestinal fortitude or t- <laughs> testicular <laughs> development. Testicular yeah, there, there, there fortitude, we go. yes. So uh, to go out and actually take a stick and poke it in the Fed's eye and say, you know, we're not going to take it anymore. And, and w- what's an you, answer? I've got, some, I've got some people who are working on that for me right now out on the Seacoast. People have been involved, uh, at disruptors in technology who are examining the, the costs and the, the, the funding, the way we fund our health care in the state and what it actually costs. Given that hospitals and insurers are, are probably nine out of the ten largest employers in the state, uh, putting aside the state government, where I think we have the highest per capita number of state employees on a higher than California, higher than, than New York. I'm checking on Illinois, but on a per capita basis, for have this many state employees is you know, beyond the beyond as well. So, uh, for a whole host of reasons, uh, you know, I'm, I'm running you know for the seat. Now, that's 95 percent of the reason you're asking me about Medicaid expansion. I'll give you the the other five percent of my motivation for running for the office is that um, you know how we political types have very thin skins. <laughs> so uh, it's only uh, it, when Nancy Stiles' press release came out, I noticed in the press release that she was retiring that both Dan Innes and Ray Tweedy were part of the, the press release. Mm-hmm. Now, wouldn't you think that the people in in the party or you know, responsible would think, here's a guy who almost took 40% of the primary last time out. Shouldn't we invite him to the party? 
Mm. I say, well, I well, no, they don't invite conservatives to the party. You <laughs> it, see, it they don't. Somebody who actually will disrupt their happy uh, little game. That's right. It's an anointing so. of sorts. These are the people we like. We want to let you know, which actually might be good for you, because you know, lately a lot of people, especially people who are most likely to vote for you, have not been happy with the direction of the party in the state. Um, so I'm hoping you know, if the case is it's the year of the outsider, then you're looking at it. Right. So that's good news. That's good news. Um, Maggie Hassan came out in a press release. Obviously, she's running for the Senate, U.S. Senate, and um, she will be facing either Jim Rubens or Kelly Ayotte or uh, Kelly Ayotte and Aaron Day because he will run if Rubens does not win. Um, so uh, she came out and, and pitched the a slightly – decreased version of the fight for 15 argument on minimum wage. Uh, she went, came out and said she, well, she'd like to see a $12 minimum wage in New Hampshire. And uh, just this week, um, a major news outlet released a survey of businesses in Washington, D.C., which has something like that already. And they were very specific in the things that happened to them as business owners. Um, they had to cut staff. They had to uh, raise prices. Uh, if they said that if it went to $15 an hour, some of them would leave Washington, D.C., or they would have to close. Um, you're a businessman. What's your perspective on this whole uh, wage there's, thing? There's no question. From, from ec every economic study you've ever looked at is any increase in the minimum wage actually costs jobs. It doesn't, doesn't help or create jobs. Very few people are, are looking to make a living wage on you know, the, the minimum wage. A lot of it is second incomes <laughs> for the, the second income earner in a, in a family. What all you do when you increase the minimum wage is wind up costing uh, lower, uh, reducing economic opportunity for a number of people. McDonald's will replace uh, keypad operators with, with kiosks. You, you're, you're, you're doing your own checkout orders at, at, at a Home Depot or a Walmart. You're going to be doing your own input orders at, at, at a McDonald's kiosk, and those people are going to lose jobs. And so uh, you can compromise at $12. I'm not, I'm not sitting here trying to be critical of Kelly's position. All I'm saying is that any increase in the minimum wage is going to have a negative impact on workers. Yeah, essentially what a, what a McDonald's will need in the future is a, is a well-armed manager with a technical uh, aptitude and uh, a roving cleaning crew to come around periodically and spruce the places up. Well, see, the, the, the bigger picture is, well, what are we going to do as automated? I mean, technology is going to continue to improve. Automation is going to continue to come alive. So we're not going to go back and get rid of all ATMs just to bring tellers on board. That, that transition is taking place, will continue to take, take place. What you need at the fundamental level is a f far superior education system to the one that we have in place today. It, it, putting aside the, the political bias that goes on from not just elementary and secondary and, and university level, I mean, it, almost a given that 90% you know, of the university is, is stifling diversity, stifling uh, uh, opinion based on what's going on in campuses today they with centers of safe zones and speech codes i mean it, it's it's absurd what's what's happening on campuses today a fundamental restructuring of education in this country has to take place jimmy carter put in place the department of education back in 1979 and every year since then there's been a decline in the sat scores with the exception of 95 when they dumbed down the sat score because it was making teachers look bad so that's a $70 billion a year federal program that should be dissolved. I mean, anyone who's not calling for the dissolution of the Federal Department of Energy, of, of Education, is uh, making and, and both. mistake. And, and both. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> well, the thing about education is that we have state school boards, and we have local school boards, and we have uh, parents and teachers and all these other people, and the Department of Education doesn't do anything that they can't do cheaper. So that is $74 million a year, $74 billion a year, sorry, right. that's, that's, that's just being sent down there so that they can decide how to send it back, and you have to do the right dance right. if you want to get your money. Which includes imp imposing Common Core. And if anyone who's spent any time on the Internet has looked at either Common Core, I'm not even going to get into the, the, the rest of the social indoctrination issues, but just look at the Common Core math to start with. Uh, it's pretty nasty. Outrageous. How do you so. feel? Oh, <laughs> never mind. All right, we're going to take a really short break, 120 seconds. We'll be right back with Steve Kent. I'm Steve McDonald with Mike Rogers. Stay tuned. From the CNHT studios in Concord, New Hampshire, just a few blocks from the New Hampshire State House, this is Rock Talk. 